Good morning again. My name is Brandon, and for those that don't know, I'm one of the pastors here at Cross Community Church. I'm over the worship and production, and I'm here to read to you this morning um, the scripture. It's Acts chapter 10. We're going to start in verse 34. It says, opening his mouth, Peter said, I most certainly understand now that God is not one to show partiality, but in every nation, the man who fears him and does what is right is welcome to him. The word which he sent to the sons of Israel, preaching peace through Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. You yourselves know the thing which took place throughout all Judea, starting from Galilee, after the baptism which John proclaimed. You know of Jesus of Nazareth, how God anointed him with the Holy Spirit and with power, and how he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil. For God was with him. We are witnesses of all the things he did, both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They also put him to death by hanging him on a cross. God raised him up on the third day and granted that he become visible, not to all the people, but to witnesses who were chosen beforehand by God, that is, to us who ate and drank with him after he arose from the dead. And he ordered us to preach to the people and solemnly to testify that this is the one who has been appointed by God as judge of the living and the dead. Of him all the prophets bear witness that through his name everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sin. While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell upon all those who were listening to the message. All the circumcised believers who came with Peter were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles also. For they were hearing them speaking with tongues and exalting God. And then Peter answered, Surely no one can refuse the water for these who to be baptized who has received the Holy Spirit just as we did, can he? And he ordered them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they asked him to stay on for a few days. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. Brandon mentioned that he is uh, over a lot of the production stuff here, that he makes sure that all the things that need to happen on Sunday morning happen. Uh, in the first service, he forgot to read for me. So if y'all production volunteers make mistakes, uh, so does Brandon. So he left me, left me hanging. <clears throat> if you haven't been with us uh, for very long, we are walking through uh, the book of Acts, or we have been for a number of weeks. And Acts is a story of how God has been building his church through the power of the Holy Spirit. And he began with his apostles, those disciples who spent three years walking with him, learning from him. But very quickly, through the Spirit, uh, the gospel goes, uh, the witness goes, not from, just through the apostles, but through ordinary believers. On the day of Pentecost, uh, several thousand men and women, women came to faith in Jesus Christ. And it began to grow, and uh, then it was 5,000, and then it was multitudes of people. The gospel began to spread, and then it leaves Jerusalem. It goes into uh, Judea and Samaria, and, and ultimately the gospel will go to the ends of the earth. And so uh, if you haven't been here with us, we've just been watching how God has been doing his work, accomplishing his work in the world. Now, one of the things that happens at times, is I've, been, I've been challenging our church to be the church of Jesus Christ, that what we wouldn't do is show up here week in and week out, going to church, hearing the sermons, singing the songs, and leave here unaffected. But the, the challenge is to be the church that every single day we wake up and we deny ourselves, we take up our cross and we follow after Jesus Christ. Our hope for every one of us is that we wouldn't be marginally devoted to Jesus, but we would be fully devoted disciples, that when people encounter us, they encounter the love of Christ, the, the witness of the gospel. And so at times in encouraging and challenging and teaching, uh, even through the book of Acts, it can feel like there's a lot of weight on my shoulders. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm a husband, I'm a wife, I, I got a family, I got a, a marriage, I've got co-workers, I've got a school that I attend. That's a lot of people that I'm responsible for. I've got to go after them, I've got to make sure they get saved and then disciple them, the scriptures would say, teach them to obey everything Jesus has commanded. That feels overwhelming. Well, today, what I, I hope to do is to give you a vision for how God works, how God works saves, how God transforms his people. And we're going to do that. There's actually a couple of visions that we're going to see. A couple of different men are going to hear from the Lord, and we're going to see how God works in each of them. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Acts chapter 10. 
The first man we're going to be introduced to is a man by the name of Cornelius. Now, Cornelius was a Roman soldier. Uh, we'll, we'll see here that he was a, a, a centurion, which meant he was over about 100 men. He was of the Italian, uh, your translation may say battalion or cohort, but that's where he was a commander. But the unique thing about Cornelius here is he has not yet heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. Cornelius was a guy who was what we would classify as someone who was a seeker, if you will. So Cornelius had been raised a Gentile, which means he didn't have the Jewish upbringing. He didn't know who God was. He didn't know uh, about the law and all those things from childhood. But rather, at some point in the life of Cornelius, he began to ask maybe life's big existential questions like, what am I here for? What is life really all about? Or perhaps Cornelius had looked at the beauty and intricacy of creation and concluded that there must be a God, and if there was indeed a God, he should probably get to know him. Uh, I, I told the early service, I'm starting to become just like my father. I went on a, a few, for a few days, we went to Pagosa Springs over fall break. And throughout the entire trip, uh, I need to point out to my family, I am compelled, I cannot help but to say, oh my gosh, y'all look at the beauty of the mountains and the, the colors. And I, and I would say to them, God spoke this into existence, you know, and my kids are like, dad, we've been in the mountains for two days. I, I get it. Like I've seen them, but I, I can't help but look at creation and think, man, God has done a great thing to look at the intricacy of the universe and to know there's a God out there. I wonder if that's where Cornelius was. Or maybe Cornelius had witnessed the miraculous, the, the blind man who'd begun to see, or the lame man who had begun to walk. We're, we're not told what it was in Cornelius that caused him to begin seeking after God, but what you're going to be introduced to here is a guy who is a Gentile who's really interested in the things of Judaism. Now, throughout this text, he's never called a proselyte, which means he had never converted fully to Judaism and undergone circumcision and all the things that the Jews would do, but he was very interested. So look at the life of Cornelius here. It says, there was a man at, at Caesarea named Cornelius, a centurion of what was called the Italian cohort. He was a devout man and one who feared God with all of his household. He gave many alms to the Jewish people, and he prayed to God continually. So he's like, y'all, he's, he's well advanced here, right? He's, he's giving money. That takes something, you know? He's interested in the things of God. But here's where I would want you to see. I think there's something much deeper going on in the heart of Cornelius, Cornelius rather than wondering about life's existential questions or just may, maybe seeing God in creation. I believe that God was pursuing the heart of Cornelius. The reason that he found himself seeking and asking questions and interested in Judaism or religion or God in general is because God was pursuing his heart. And in Luke chapter 19, it's the story of Zacchaeus. Jesus tells us that he came to seek and to save that which was lost. The heart of God toward people is that he desires to seek after and ultimately to save them. That rather than spend our life wondering about these existential questions or wondering who God is, God desires to reveal himself to the world that he ultimately might save us, save men and, and women. And so here's Cornelius, and he's asking this question, and I don't think it's happening on accident. I think God has stirred in his heart and caused him to begin asking these questions questions. Maybe you're here today, and you're like, I don't know why I'm at church. And somebody invited me. I don't know how I wound up here. I don't know how I got interested in religion or the Bible or who God is. And I would just want to say to you, if you are that person, if you're here and you're wondering, you know, what's going on, I believe that the God of the universe is pursuing your heart and he desires to reveal himself to you. He desires ultimately to save you. So here's what he did in the life of Cornelius, this seeker. Verse 3, about the ninth hour of the day, he clearly saw in a vision an angel of God who had just come in and said to him, Cornelius. Now, this must have been quite a shock. Uh, he didn't know who God was. He recognizes this is a vision from God. And so he's fixing his gaze on him, verse 4, and being much alarmed. He's afraid, y'all. He said, what is it, Lord? And he said to him, your prayers and alms have, been, have ascended as a memorial before God. Now dispatch some men to Joppa to send for a man named Simon, who's also called Peter. He is staying with a tanner named Simon, whose house is by the sea. 
When the angel who was speaking to him had left, he summons two of his servants a devout, and a devout soldier of those who were his personal tenants. And after he'd explained everything to them, everything to them, he sent them to Joppa. This must have been a remarkable experience. He doesn't know Jesus. He hadn't understood the gospel at this point. But here is God pursuing this man, Cornelius, to the extent that he would even send an angel of God to him saying, I want you to go and send for a man named Peter. There's a second vision revealed here. This time, God reveals himself to Peter in verse 9. It says, On the next day, as they were uh, on their way and approaching the city, Peter went up to the housetop, his own housetop, about the sixth hour to pray. But he became hungry and was desiring to eat. But while they were making preparations, while the food was still being prepared, he fell into a trance. This is another vision. And he saw a really interesting scene, especially if you were a good Jew. He saw the sky opened up and an object like a great sheet coming down, lowered by four corners to the ground. And there were in it all kinds of four-footed animals and crawling creatures of the earth and birds of the air. A voice came to him, every hunter's favorite passage, by the way. He says, get up, Peter, kill and eat. And so Peter, he's looking at this vision that he's seen. The sheet is lowered. It's filled with all kinds of animals. Scholars love to debate what sorts of animals are here, but I think it is extremely clear from the text that what Peter was looking at were these animals, these birds, these things that crawled on the ground that were forbidden by Jewish law to be consumed by a Jewish person. As a matter of fact, I believe the things that he saw on the sheet were the specific items listed in the Old Testament, in the Torah, that Jews were not supposed to consume them at all. As a matter of fact, if you did, it would make you unclean. This must have been a troubling thing for Peter. Y'all, we're not talking about a guy who, you know, at 30, 40 years of age, to kind of learn some religious rules. You're talking about a man who from his earliest days would have been taught, don't touch that. It'll make you unclean. Don't eat that. That's not who we are as a people. We are the Jewish people, the chosen people of God. This is how we live. Our guide is the law. Our guide is the Torah. And so we follow after God by following after the Torah. And the Torah says, don't eat these things. And so Peter has this vision, the sheet lowered, and, and, and a voice from heaven saying, get up and kill and eat. In verse 14, Peter said, by no means, Lord. Now, that's, that's an interesting response, right? You're a follower of God, and God tells you in a vision to do something. He's like, I ain't doing it. No way. I will. I will not do that, Lord. Uh, for I have never eaten anything unholy and unclean. Again, a voice came to him a second time. What God has cleansed no longer consider unholy. This happened three times, and immediately the object was taken up into the sky. Now, while Peter was greatly perplexed, and Peter is struggling with what he's just seen and what he's just heard in this vision, because God was, was the God of the law, right? The way that we know how to follow God, our guide, is the law. That was what the Jews believed. Their lives were centered around following the law. As a matter of fact, when they broke the law, they had to offer a sacrifice for sin that they could be right with God. And so Peter, he wants to be good with God as a good Jew, and then he sees this vision, uh, you know, the sheet coming from heaven. He's supposed to do something the law forbids him to do. Three times God tells tells him to do it three times. He denies, but he's sitting there and he's perplexed and he's wrestling with what he's just seen. Now, the circumstances from the beginning of Acts to this point uh, must have been pretty overwhelming. For a good Jew, Peter had followed after Jesus. He'd walk with him. He'd talk with him. He'd seen Jesus crucified and then raised from the dead. He'd seen the Holy Spirit come and the Jewish people speaking in languages that they didn't know, everyone hearing in their own tongues at Pentecost, like remarkable things had happened uh, because of the coming of the Holy Spirit. And here he sees the vision and God telling him to do something that seems to be in contradiction with the law of God. He's perplexed. Now, while he was greatly perplexed in mind as to what the vision he had seen might be, behold, the men who had been sent by Cornelius, vision number one, those men who were sent, 
The men uh, who had been sent by Cornelius, having asked for directions for Simon's house, appeared at the gate. And calling out, they were asking whether Simon, who was also called Peter, was staying there. Well, again, he's reflecting on the vision. The Spirit says to him, Behold, three men are looking for you. Get up, go downstairs, and accompany them without misgivings. Peter, don't be afraid. For I have sent them myself. And Peter went down to the men and said, Behold, I'm the one you're looking for. Why are you here? What's the reason that you guys have come? And they said, Cornelius the centurion, a righteous and God-fearing man, well spoken of by the entire nation of the Jews, was divinely directed by a holy angel to send for you to come to his house and hear a message for you. And so he invites them in and gave them lodging. Two men, two visions, and God is up to something. I believe that God is pursuing the heart of Cornelius and God is pursuing the heart of Peter and even broader God is teaching us something about his heart toward the people in general about his heart for the world that is around us and so I want to give you just a couple things that we can glean from this story but I'm going to read a few more verses for you here beginning in verse 23 Peter gets up I guess they stay the night there And on the next day he got up and went away with them. And some of the brethren from Joppa accompanied him. And on the following day he entered Caesarea. Now Cornelius was waiting for them and had called together his relatives and close friends. I would argue that if God uh, appears to you in a vision and tells you to send for this man, like have him come back and visit you, you might do what Cornelius did. Like God's up to something big here. I saw a vision. He told me to send for this guy. He's going to come and tell us something. I'm calling my friends and family too. If nothing else, there's going to be a show, right? You're kind of excited about this. And so Cornelius, he gathers his family around. Peter has showed up. Now he responds rather inappropriately toward another person of God. But in verse 25, when Peter enters his house, Cornelius met him and fell at his feet and worshiped him. Peter, no, 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 hold on. I'm just a man just like you. Uh, Peter raised him up saying, stand up, I'm just a man. And he talked with him and he entered and he found many people assembled. And then we see why God was so thorough. Why God repeated himself three times to Peter. Yeah, God was talking about food to Peter, but he was also talking about something more significant. Peter says to these men, these are Gentile men. Jews and Gentiles, they didn't get to go together because Gentiles didn't follow the law. They hadn't been circumcised. They didn't eat the right things. And when you consume unclean things, That means that you're unclean. And for a good Jew to uh, sit down and have a meal with a Gentile, that would make that good Jew unclean. And that's a problem, right? For you to stay in their house would render you unclean. And so you weren't fit to worship God in the temple without this. uh, You had to go through this ceremonial washing and cleansing that you could be made clean again. And Peter points this out, that God has been up to something in the midst of these visions And he said to him, you yourselves know how unlawful it is for a man who is a Jew, that's Peter, to associate with a foreigner or visit with him. These were the Gentile believers. You know this is against the law. And yet God has shown me that I should not call any man unholy or unclean. Peter, what God has cleansed, don't call it unholy. That's why I came without even raising any objection for, for when I was sent. So I asked for, what reason have you sent for me? What did God tell you that I was supposed to come to do? Cornelius said, four days ago to this hour, I was praying in my house during the ninth hour, and behold, a man stood before me in shining garments, and he said, Cornelius, your prayer has been heard, your alms have been remembered before God, therefore send to Joppa and invite Simon, who is also called Peter, to come to you. He's staying at the house of Simon the Tanner by the sea, and I sent for you immediately, and you have been kind enough to come. Now then, here's the reason that you're here, Peter. We are all here present before God to hear all that you have been commanded by God. The Lord. Think about how much God loved Cornelius and his friends and his family to take two men in two different places to send two different visions 
that Cornelius, who was seeking after God because God had already been seeking after him, God was already drawing his heart, he did all of this that Cornelius and his companions could hear the gospel. Now, this is a rather lengthy text, and, and Peter is going to explain the gospel to them, but I, I just want to give it to you um, in one simple verse, one that you might already know. Romans chapter 6, verse 23, says it very simply. For the wages of sin is death. The thing that we've earned because we sinned against God, and, and all of us have done that, I mean, you, you've lied in your life. Maybe it was a little white lie, but you know how it is. You think it's a little white lie, and then there's another one, and it gets, it gets out of control, right? Or maybe for you, you're like me, and the little Brock's candy station at the grocery store was basically entrapment, and you stole something, you know, and you, had a, you, you know you've done wrong. Or, or maybe you have spoken words that you knew caused pain and hurt to other people. Maybe you crossed lines you swore you would never cross. No matter where you are, Every one of us has sinned, and the Scripture tells us that the wage of that sin is death. That means that we're separated from God. We, who are sinful, are separated from God who is perfect. It's like oil and water. They can't mix. What fellowship does light have with darkness? We are separated from God because of our sin. But then here's the good news. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. So salvation is different than sin. What we earned was death. Because of our sin, because of what we did, what we deserved was death and separation from God. However, salvation and eternal life is given as a gift. We didn't deserve it, and we sure didn't earn it, but God freely gives salvation to those who would come to faith in Him. And so because of the work of Jesus Christ on the cross... Jesus came to earth, God in the flesh. He came to seek and to save that which is lost. And he went to the cross to pay the wage for our sin. He went to the cross to pay the debt that you and I owed because of our sin and our behavior. Jesus went and paid that price on the cross. He took all of our sin and our guilt and our shame, and there on the cross he bore the just punishment for that sin. And there on the cross, God took that righteous life of Jesus Christ, that perfect, sinless life that he lived, and he credited that to our account. He took our sin away, and he gave to us righteousness because of Jesus. That's how we have fellowship with God. We're made righteous not by our deeds, but by the work of Jesus Christ. And Peter is preaching this gospel message to the Gentiles, who he would have sworn were excluded. For whatever reason, God, who in his work of salvation, I want you to see how he works here, he's the one who seeks after the lost. He is the one who saves the lost. But guess what? He has chosen to use his church to do one simple thing, and that is to share the gospel. That is to tell the good news of Jesus Christ. So think about this. God has already spoken to Cornelius in a vision. He could have just spoken the gospel to him. But God has chosen to use his church to carry the gospel message to the world. And so he goes to all of this trouble. Hey, Cornelius, send men to Peter. Peter, come to Cornelius' house. Uh, Peter, I want you to share the gospel. And and if you think, oh, listen, I I can't share the gospel. I don't know enough. I'm not good enough. I want you to see that just it's hilarious how God worked here while Peter was still preaching. I don't know if he was long-winded. I don't know if he was overly thorough. Maybe he just wasn't doing all that good of a job. But while Peter was still preaching, he wasn't even finished yet. In verse 44, while he was still speaking these words, speaking the gospel to the people, the Holy Spirit fell on all those who were listening to the message. It is never our responsibility to save anybody. And it's not our, our responsibility to draw them to Christ or to make them ask the questions, to persuade them. It's not our responsibility to do any of that. The church of Jesus Christ has been given one responsibility, 
and that is to be witnesses for Jesus Christ. And God empowers even that through his Holy Spirit. God saves Cornelius and his companions on this day. In verse 45, all the circumcised believers who came with Peter, there were some men who traveled with him from Joppa, they were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles also. For they were hearing them speaking with tongues and exalting God. And Peter answered, Surely no one can refuse water for those to be baptized who have received the Holy Spirit just as we did, can he? And he ordered them to be baptized in the name of Jesus. And they asked him to stay on for a few days. It's, it's really interesting what happens here among these Gentile people. Now, not every time that people are given the Holy Spirit do they speak in tongues. It didn't happen with the apostle Paul or Saul when he was converted on the road to Damascus. He was actually blind, right? He didn't have the gift of tongues. We didn't see it with the Ethiopian eunuch when Philip went to him and prayed with him there on the road. We didn't see tongues. Do you know the last time we saw tongues? On the day of Pentecost, when the gospel went out to the Jews and the Holy Spirit was poured out upon those who believed, you know what happened? They began to speak in tongues that they didn't know. And everyone around could hear and understand them to be praising God, and they heard and understood in their own language. Do you know what happened when the Holy Spirit was poured out on the Gentiles? They began to speak in tongues too. And what Peter understands, he actually tells us back in, in verse uh, 34, as he begins to proclaim the gospel to the Gentiles, I most certainly understand now that God is not one to show partiality, but in every nation, the man who fears him and does what is right is welcome to him. What we see is now the gospel going to the nations. The gospel does not know some geographic barrier. It doesn't know an ethnic barrier or any cultural barriers. It's not about like how much money you make or how you present yourself, how sinful you've been or how righteous you've been. The gospel goes out to every single person. Person, and that should encourage you, right, uh, for yourself. If you're not a believer here, I would want you to know that the heart of God is he's come to seek and to save that which was lost, and there are no other conditions for that. That is the heart of God toward us, and God, who is seeking and saving that which is lost, has given us the opportunity to participate in that process by simply proclaiming the gospel. And even if you're not very good at it, and God does the work. He's the one who saves, and I want you to just rest in that. And if, if you've been thinking about, man, I know there's this person in my life, and I'm anxious. i got to share the gospel, and I don't want to mess it up, and I'm not sure I can answer all the questions. You don't have to. And your responsibility is to present the gospel and sit back and watch the work of God who transforms the hearts of men. If God is sending you to them, man, maybe you've been praying, and that person that's been on your heart, and you, you've been thinking about it, you've been seeing him at work, and you get anxious just thinking about it. Listen, God has already been at work in them, and he desires, he's been seeking that which is lost in order that he might save them. So we understand how God works in salvation. But there's another story here for us. I also want you to see how God performs this work of transformation in us. Maybe you're here and you're a believer in Jesus Christ, but when you think about your faithfulness before God, you think about how well you're living out the truth of the word, you look at your life and you're like, God, I'm, I'm messing it up. You know, remember who Peter was? Remember when Jesus got arrested? He was supposed to be praying before that, but Peter had fallen asleep. He wasn't a very good prayer. And then when Jesus got arrested, uh, Peter thinks he's got a fight, and so he takes his sword, and he cuts off the, the ear of the, the servant of Malchus, the high priest. And, and, and Jesus is like, no, 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 Peter, not, not that. And here God is speaking to Peter, and he tells him three times, hey, Peter, what God has cleansed, what God has made holy, don't call it unholy. And three times, Peter's like, listen, God, I've, I've never, never done, I've never eaten anything unholy or unclean, never in my life. I'm not sure that I can obey you. Listen, Peter was stubborn, y'all. And yet God is patient with us. God is patient with us. And he is the one, not only who saves, he's also the one who transforms our hearts. You know how Hebrews describes God? As the author of and perfecter of our faith. God is at work, work both in the unbeliever 
to save them and in the believer to transform our hearts that we might begin to live out the abundant life that he has for us. And do you know how both of those things happen? You know, the fact that Jesus Christ died on the cross for sin doesn't actually save us. And the fact that God is at work in our lives to do this work of transformation, it doesn't actually save us. Do you know what saves us ultimately? Us responding in faith to the work of God on our behalf. We are saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ, and that's not of ourselves. It's the gift of God so that none of us can boast. We are saved by faith, and we are transformed by faith. And here's what that looks like for us. It looks like saying yes to God. And maybe for you, you've been a believer for some time, and you've been resisting God, and you've not taken that little step of faith to say, God, I believe you can use me. God, I see that you're calling me to somebody or to something, and today I want to say yes to you. I'm going to trust. Listen, I, I know all my weaknesses. I know all my inadequacies, but God, I'm not going to trust in me. I'm going to trust in you, and so I'm going to go and maybe give the single worst gospel presentation that's ever been given in my life, but God, I'm going to trust not in myself, but I'm going to trust in you. Or, or maybe for you, it's like it's, it's, it's giving. Or maybe for you, it's serving somebody. But here's the thing. Here's how God works in us. We take this tiny little step of faith in trusting God, and he begins to, to build our faith. We see that God comes through for us, that we can trust him more and more, and we begin to give God more and more of our lives. Peter was as stubborn as they come. And yet God uses this man, Peter. He preaches on the day of Pentecost, and thousands come to faith. He resists God in the vision three times, just as he denied even knowing Jesus three times. And God still uses him to go and preach the gospel to the Gentiles. And men and women are saved. The gospel now goes out to the remaining world at the time. Because Peter dared to respond in faith. And so today, for you, this is, this is my challenge if you're here and you're not a believer in Jesus Christ, I want you to know it's not a coincidence that you're here. I don't think it's just a crazy happenstance that you're hearing these words right now. What I believe is that God is drawing your heart. If you're not a believer in Jesus Christ, you've heard the gospel. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. I want to challenge you today. I want to urge you today to say yes to God. And you may just be overwhelmed with just how sinful you've been. I don't want you to know that God is still a better Savior than you are a sinner. I want to encourage you to say yes to God. If you're here today and you know you're a believer and you've been buying a lie about yourself that you're too sinful and you're too weak and you don't have enough in and of yourself to go out and live as a witness, here's what I want you to hear. Um, we should certainly not look at races or classes of people and think God can't use them, God can't save them. And yet it seems like in the American church, we are much more comfortable with God using and saving somebody else than we are with God using and saving us. And I would want to say this for you, for the person that you see in the mirror every single day, do not call unclean that which God has made holy. Man, if you have come to faith in Jesus Christ, you're not your sin. You're not your past. You're not your mistakes. You're not your weaknesses. You are a new creation in Christ Jesus. And my encouragement to you is to just to say yes to God in faith, to whatever he may be leading you to do today. Maybe it's a person. Maybe it's a place. Whatever God is calling you to do today, I want to just encourage you to respond to him. Salvation and transformation are his work. We simply respond in faith. Would you bow with me? Oh, God, we thank you for this gift of the Spirit. We thank you that it's not up to us to save ourselves or to transform ourselves. But God, I pray that as we see the goodness of the gospel of Jesus Christ, which finds all of us in our sin, every single man and woman and child in this room, we are sinful. And yet, God, we are made righteous by the gift of your grace, by the work of Jesus Christ on the cross for us.
Lord, I pray that you would give us a gift of faith today. Faith unto salvation. Faith unto transformation. Faith unto obedience. God, we need you. We know that you're seeking after us, and I pray that you would have your way in this place this morning. In Jesus' name, amen.